nice to be with everyone today. For those of uh, you who don't know me, I've been at uh, Vizient now for 10 years through the University Health System Consortium, where I led the comparative data offerings. Uh, before that, 15 years in healthcare administration, various roles, including chief quality officer, vice president of operations. Uh, I also have two master's degrees and a PhD in health services research. My dissertation topic was on um, was on quality improvement implementation in hospitals. So I am I am blessed at Vizient currently to be able to uh, work with our members who subscribe to our comparative data offerings to be able to use data to improve. I'm a resource for those organizations that uh, subscribe to the data products. And as such, I am uh, traveling all the time and I've spent uh, time at many of your organizations. For those of you who do know me, I want to give a quick thanks to our excellent marketing team at Vizient, particularly Joel Granier and Liz Morley for helping me shape a presentation today that is not going to be duplicative to what you may have heard. Yes, you still may hear some of the same stories that I bring along and, and talk about, but those are stories that hopefully will drive the point of transparency and its value in, uh, in benchmarking and also in improvement. And while many of our data offerings have transparency as a characteristic, I'm going to be speaking about the clinical database uh, because it is most apparent, transparency is most apparent in the clinical database, uh, which now has 340 organizations sending us data on a monthly basis, both inpatients and hospital-based outpatients. So as we get started, I want you to think about this question, and a poll has popped up, and I want you to answer it. I want you to think about it and answer it about what are the What's the following do you think is the biggest barrier uh, to performance improvement in your organization? And boy, do we have a cast of, of answers that I think uh, fit uh, barriers quite well. So if you just take a couple of seconds to think about this and answer it for your organization, that would be great. Okay, so if we could bring up, Stacy the answers. So we have... As I would have expected, a wide variety. Uh, we have uh, right around 18% for leadership focus, for physician buy-in, and for lack of available resources. Lack of insights from data is in the lead at 23%, and lack of accurate data uh, trails only by a couple of percentage points. So very uh, interesting, but also what I expected. Um, I expected... Uh, to see this wide variation, a lot of people with different thinking on, on, on this. And we're going to get back to this question after the end. I don't expect this presentation to change your point of view, but I do expect to talk a little bit more about it and what I um, really uh, um, would have liked to have seen in this question a little bit later. Why, is it, uh, why do we have these barriers? Why is performance improvement uh, difficult? Well, if you've heard me talk, you've heard that uh, I believe that performance improvement is a challenge. Uh, it is a challenge in our organization, and uh, a lot of people agree with me, including folks like Don Berwick, who call it the biggest issue that we have in the American healthcare system is our inability to improve. And as we begin to see less reimbursement, and we will, because, uh, because CMS is moving towards bankruptcy, we will see tremendously lower uh, reimbursements. We're going to have to find a way, another way to be able to achieve the triple aim, achieve the fact that we need lower cost and better care. And what do I mean by that? Well, I've seen some organizations do some fabulous work in improving mortality or improving length of stay or improving readmissions. But very few organizations I've seen tackle reduction of clinical variation that exists right now. Now, some of you may be saying, well, we're doing this, we're moving um, closer towards that, but I don't see it done in a broad aspect. And what I mean by that is that I used to be the associate vice president for surgical services at a hospital, uh, Shadyside Hospital, which is part of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And at that point in time, we had five cardiac surgeons that were doing cabbage surgery. Now, these five happened to be part of the same group, but they had five separate 
uh, separate cards, preference cards for their work in the operating room. They had five separate ways that they wanted the PACU nurses and the nurses on the floor to take care of their patients. Now, I know that that occurs in all organizations right now. That's the type of clinical variation that I'm talking to. The organizations that can use the data that exists currently to be able to motivate change and reduce those preference cards to one instead of five to get one way of handling patients all throughout the hospital for all clinical conditions, those are going to be the organizations that are going to thrive in this era of lower uh, reimbursement. That's the type of, of improvement that we need to be able to get. That's the type of improvement that we at Vizient have really tried to structure ourselves around. So in terms of improvement, every organization has a role, and that role is in the middle column under member. There has to be some leadership focus. I've never seen an improvement occur without some sort of leadership focus. There has to be the ability to drill down in the data, understand the data, use it to insights to be able to motivate change, and then you have to have engaged, engaged clinicians. But if I've learned one thing over the last 30 years is that improvement is a team sport, and you need a partner to be able to work with you to get you that improvement. This is what we've done over at Vizient over the last couple of years since we've uh, merged and purchased and come together as five organizations. We're going to provide you with world-class data, but we're also going to provide you with people that can give you support, expertise, insights, give you uh, collaboratives to work through, give you best practices, help you network with other organizations, all for the intention of getting improvement to occur. But it all starts with world-class data. And when I talk about world-class data, I'm, I'm suggesting that there are three characteristics of world-class data that must be present in order to be able to get accelerated improvement. Standardized data, so data coming in in a very standardized fashion. Second would be the ability to drill down substantially into that data. Giving a metrics without the ability to drill down is useless. So you have to be able to understand why you might be different. And then the third is transparency, and that's what I'm going to be highlighting in this presentation. Transparency, one of the things that it really does help is to be able to get to that third bullet under the member, which is engaged clinicians. Shannon Sims, a friend who also who worked at Rush in Chicago and freighted in Milwaukee, has taken the Kubler-Ross stages of grief and adapted those to the stages of quality measurement. And any one of us on this call have heard those first four things over and over again. Transparency allows for acceptance to occur. Let me give you an example. I was approached by a director of quality for a large academic medical center who said, we had tried to get our cardiologists engaged on reducing length of stay. And initially when we were showing them the data, they didn't believe the data, or they came back to us and said, length of stay is really more of an operational issue. We'd like you to be able to remove barriers so that we can reduce our length of stay. We don't necessarily need to be engaged. And that was until that director of quality was able to go out and find four or five prestigious organizations, other academic medical centers, bring it back to the cardiologist, identified, and say, well, what's interesting is we are a day or two longer in a specific clinical condition within cardiology than these other four organizations. And what happens is the cardiologist took a look at those other four organizations and they uh, said, interesting, we want to know more. We want to get more engaged in this idea of improvement of length of stay. I don't, I don't, um, like buying a car. I'm not sure who does. And the reason I don't like buying a car is because I don't feel like I have all the information, all the insights that I need when I walk into a dealership. I feel like I'm at a disadvantage uh, for organizations uh, or for when I walk into that dealership as well, a disadvantage against the person who's trying to sell me the car. And I, I feel helpless, in fact, this has all changed a little bit, or a lot actually, over the last 10 to 15 years now that we can go on to places like cars.com. I recently bought a Jeep, and I wanted to go on to be able to take a look at the Jeep, but I wanted to be able to compare it against other cars that I felt were like the Jeep. 
not an aggregate group of cars that may have included anything from the Kia Sportage to the Range Rover, which kind of smooths everything out, but cars that I felt were similar to what I was wanting to look at to see what the differences were. That has given me the advantage of being less helpless when I go in and work with a, a dealer to be able to get that car because I understand and I know and I have insights into a lot more. It's the exact same thing what we're talking about here with transparency in clinical benchmarking. Our competitors will talk to you about how they provide you great comparisons. Their comparisons are not transparent. You're not able to see those hospitals by name. Instead, you're giving a line that said comparators. They're given a line that says there are 100 hospitals within this where the average bed is 330 um, beds. When you start peeling away the onions and you start going in and looking at who's included in there, you're going to find Kia Sportages and you're going to find Range Rovers. And what you really want to be able to do is choose, do I want to compare myself more against Range Rovers or do I want to compare myself more against the Kia Sportage? If you were able to unpeel the onion and look at these comparators, first of all, you would find that there is a variation in terms of bed size, maybe between 220 and 450. If you were able to get a list of the hospital's names that were in the comparator group that you're looking at, you may see 10 St. Joseph's hospitals, but you don't know any of those hospitals. They're all scattered across the U.S. You don't know much about those hospitals don't have a lot of attributes other than the fact that their name is St. Joseph's. Also, uh, you'll find that if you even peel back the onion even further, is that some of those organizations may have stated that they were 220 beds, but they're no longer running at 220 beds. I worked for an organization. We always stated we had 350 to 400 beds. We were running at about 220, 230 beds. And also, many of our competitors uh, will allow hospitals to send in incomplete data. And so you don't know when you're taking a look at anything, including basic things like numbers of inpatient surgeries, inpatient discharges, CMI, those types of things, whether or not those hospitals are sending that data in. Our competitors would tell you that bigger is better, that you're able to look at 100 uh, different uh, organizations when you're taking a look at this, uh, but bigger is not better for improvement. In fact, uh, transparent groups are of 10 or more are better than non-transparent groups of 100. And what do I mean by there? I mean that if you are able to get a transparent group of 10 to 15 organizations that you feel are like you, then you need to be able to get to know those organizations or you can get to know those organizations. And if you don't know those organizations, then we give you attributes about those at Vizient. You can contact us and we can get you in contact with people there. I've had organizations that are staunch competitors that are next door to each other uh, get together for improvement's sake. Remember, improvement's a team sport. You need a group, uh, a partner like Vizient. You also need a partner uh, and other partners in the healthcare arena to be able to work with you to be able to do this. So 10 to 15 organizations are much better for uh, improvement than a non-transparent group of 100 because then you can get to know those organizations and you can develop what we're calling maybe something like an improvement community to get improvement to occur. How does that look in our clinical database where we have some flexible reporting tools, the main two tools within the clinical database or the Report Express and the Report Builder. The difference is the Report Express is an easy to access spot where you can get template dashboards and scorecards. These template dashboards and scorecards vary from one being a balanced scorecard to one being uh, looking at risk adjusted mortality. And you can also then go into the Report Builder from that to be able to mine and organize the data your way. So what we tell folks is that the template dashboards and scorecards tell you that you're different, but you need to go into the report builder to understand why you're different in any one of a number of different metrics that you see listed below. This just gives you a quick screenshot of a couple of the report express reports that we have. On the top left, you'll see the vitals and performance tool, which is a balanced scorecard looking at metrics in six different areas. 
And then the other three would be what we call um, management reports. We have a suite of management reports, again, that can be accessed, dashboards and scorecards that can be used very easily. The nice thing about the Report Express and in terms of transparency is that for each one of these metrics, whether each one of the boxes in vitals and performance or the rows in the uh, management reports, you can drill down one level and you'll get to see who the top 10 organizations are in that particular metric. Now, we tell people to be a bit cautious when they're looking at those top 10s because they uh, when, when you do go down, there might be some organizations that you may not want to compare against. That's fine. Move on. You've got the report builder then to go and drill down substantially and to develop your own custom compare group. There might be some characteristics of those organizations in the top 10 that uh, you need to know about uh, beforehand. So contact us and talk to us about them. For example, we have one international hospital in the database. That's Ottawa Hospital. They are a fabulous hospital in Canada. They want to be one of the top hospitals in North America. And uh, what they're in the clinical database to do is to do that type of transparent comparison. However, their financing up in Canada is a lot different than what we experience here in, in America. And so ours is based on how many and the right diagnoses codes and procedure codes that we can get to the insurance companies. And so there's a premium for us to be able to make sure that we have as many diagnoses codes, ICD-10 codes as possible. Not so in Canada. They're required just to be able to put that patient into a clinical condition. So they're not worried as much about documenting and coding uh, comorbid conditions and complications. And so what that means is that for our complication report, which is called the Quality Safety Management Report, or as University of Minnesota calls it, the QUISMER, the QUISMER uh, when you drill down into each one of those metrics, you most likely will see Ottawa Hospital up there because it's a large hospital and zero, um, uh, zero uh, complications. Does that mean that they don't have complications? It's probably much more of an effect of the coding and documentation. So those are the things that you have to kind of notice. Once you get to use this tool more often, you'll get to know some of those things, but if you don't, that's why we're here at Disney to be able to give you that information. But what we really do look at in transparency, that is really focused in the report builder. In the report builder, you're able to go in and develop custom compare groups of the way that you really want to be able to take a look at it. So you can select from a list of every hospital in the database. That's over on the right-hand side. Again, 345 hospitals listed there. You can also do this by system. Some of our organizations are now looking at one of the 50 systems that we have, comparing themselves against uh, systems individually. One of the nice things is once you develop your custom compare group, you can save it. So we have many of our organizations that are developing multiple custom compare groups. And what I mean by that is that they are going to a service line or an institute, and they're saying to the leaders there, the physician and nursing leaders, who would you like to compare against? They are bringing with them the list of 340 hospitals. The uh, individuals would check off a number of hospitals that they would look at. And then it would be up to an analyst to go into the report builder to make sure that those organizations are appropriate for being a custom compare group for that particular institute and that particular service line. So for example, they're going in and seeing, do they have enough volume to be able to compare against us? Do they have um, the outcomes that we really want to be able to take a look at? Do they look like us? All of that is um, you're able to do in this section when you're taking a look at that. There are some pre-selected cohorts um, involved in this, and you're also able to look at them individually or aggregated. By default, you're going to see these hospitals on a, a separate line individually identified, or you can go in and, and um, use it aggr uh, in the aggregate. It would be madness if we just gave you that list of 340 hospitals and you were to scroll down and try to look at all of those. Uh, when I started at uh, Legacy UHC 10 years ago, we had 107 hospitals in the database and it was easier. It was much easier to go through this list and just pick this is the one that I want to be able to look at or this is the one that I want to look at. But now with 340 hospitals, it's very difficult. So what we've done is we've developed a tool called the Hospital Profiler that will help you select your custom compare group. It provides a list of hospitals 
that you can go in a number of attributes about those. And the reason why that's important is because building a custom compare group, particularly a transparent custom compare group, is an art form much more than it is a science. A lot of people may use case volumes, but in this case, you'll see that this hospital decided to use various case levels and used other attributes to be able to build their custom compare group. Other attributes and other factors might include bed size, might include volumes in, in a lot of different things. Hospital characteristics are something that a lot of organizations want to be able to take a look at when they look at like organizations or apples to apples comparisons. Performance as well. How do they perform on something? So, for example, West Virginia has done a really nice job, I think, of developing custom compare groups. And their goal is always to be at the, 20, the top 25th percentile of the custom compare groups that they develop. And so they're developing those custom compare groups, not from just whoever um, they want to be able to take a look at, but they're going in and saying, okay, we want the best of the best, and we want to be at the 25th, 25th percentile of that. That's what that's our goal is. And or locations. Uh, while I do have hospitals that really are, are interested in looking at hospitals next door or right near them, uh, we also have hospitals that are more interested in looking at hospitals that they believe are more like them, even if they are in Florida and that hospital happens to be in the state of Washington. So again, it's more of an art form uh, than a science. And we allow you to be able to use that art form in our hospital profiler. Our hospital profiler lists all the hospitals, a number of attributes about them that would be found in the profile general area. Uh, but what a lot of people might not know is you can go and click over into the profile feature area or the base MSD or G area. The profile feature area will give a number of hospital characteristics that you see here, everything from trauma center level to pancreas transplants, whether they do those or not. And the list of hospitals, the 345 hospitals, will constrict every time you choose one of these um, items so that it really is a nice tool to be able to say, who's like me? Who do I want to be like me? Now, most of the organizations in the, or, uh, in the uh, clinical database you'll know. Most of the organizations uh, you'll know because they're academic medical center, prestigious hospitals. And we also do then connect each of the affiliate organizations with their system hospitals. So if there's a Fairview hospital, uh, we have it listed as CC or Cleveland Clinic Fairview so that you get an understanding of that. But as we become Vizient, and now that we can sell this uh, beyond academic medical centers and their affiliate organizations, it's really uh, taken off. We've actually had about 50 new hospitals just in the last year, year and a half, and that continues to grow. So we're really excited about exposing this uh, beyond just the academics and their affiliate organizations. But once we start doing that, you're going to see hospitals like Sanford, uh, Theta Care, uh, Palmetto, all of which are just uh, coming in very, very excellent hospitals uh, that do deserve to be able to be part of your custom compare groups uh, many of the times. And so that's why we have all of these hospital-specific features, all these characteristics that you can drill down and take a look at. What does that lead to? Uh, that leads to being able to write reports to your heart's content to really understand who's doing well. Uh, I call the report builder addictive over 40,000 reports are written off of it each and every month. Uh, and what I mean by that is that it gives you the sense after you get an understanding of it that you can write every report. As one CEO of an organization told me who actually writes report out of the report builder, he said, you can write a million reports. Now, I'm guessing you could probably write more than a million um, separate reports on it. But again, if you, we just gave you the fact that you have a red dot in risk-adjusted mortality for cardiology, that would be useless. You need to be able to drill down to find out, is it a specific pr uh, procedure? Is, is it a specific base MSDRG? Is it a specific physician? Is it uh, complications? Uh, who does well in risk-adjusted mortality in cardiology? And it may be those hospitals on the left-hand side that you can choose from. All of that you're able to do. The thing with the report builder, though, is if you're going to go in and write reports now and wait for about a month later to go back in and write a couple of reports, it's not going to be as valuable. You have to carve out time almost on a weekly basis to be able to use it. And once you start to do that, I guarantee you, because of the transparency, because of the drill down um, capabilities, you are going to be addicted. You're going to continue to carve out more and more time. 
and you're going to find yourself on Friday nights even writing reports. Hopefully you're going to do it either with some beer or a good glass of wine uh, at that point in time. But this is a tool that is um, great to be able to get from the point where you get data to insights. Insights is what really motivates change because of the transparency and the ability to drill down substantially. So for example, I can find out if I'm Purple Hospital. I can find out that I'm 116th out of 128 hospitals in risk-adjusted mortality for major, small, and large bowels. Now, what I've done is I've chosen only hospitals that do more than 150 cases of these because I'm doing 214, so I don't want to be able to get hospitals that are tiny. I also may want to be able to constrict it at some upper level. I can do that, but I've just chosen those over 115. My mortality index is 1.5. That's the last column. That's the um, observed divided by the expected. And anything above one is going to be worse than expected. Anything below one is going to be better than expected. So it does suggest that I have some opportunity here, but it's only when the transparency comes in. It's only when that I can choose those hospitals that do more than 150 cases that have excellent mortality and disease, as you can see by those first 10 hospitals. And it's only when I'm able to see that it's green and yellow hospital. It's only when I'm able to go in and understand who green and yellow hospital are that now I'm on the road to really understanding why I might be different. Because there are some of these hospitals that you may say, no, I understand why they probably uh, have this type of mortality index, and you might want to be able to, to throw those out and bring in other hospitals. But that's the value of transparency and drilling down. It allows you then to take your hospital and start developing smaller custom compare groups uh, and looking at things like discharge data. So I found that Discharge status matters when we're talking about mortality. Since we look at mortality in the hospital, I want to know what percentage of cases are going to hospice or to SNF, and I also want to know the length of stay, how long those um, patients are there. So if you look at just the SNF or long-term care discharges for purple hospitals, you can see that 7% of them are going to SNF or long-term care. You can see that Urban U down below is at 10%. Teaching affiliates at 6%, prestige at 9%, so on and so forth. But they're staying 25 days before they're able to get back to a SNF or, or out to a long-term care or back to a long-term care. That's 15 days in some cases more than what we're seeing uh, for some of these other hospitals. Those 15 days may be the difference between living uh, and dying in the hospital. We really encourage organizations to be able to look at palliative care, as I see below, hospice rate, all these other types of things to be able to understand why you're different. And you can only do that if you feel comfortable that you're comparing against hospitals that you believe you should be comparing against. We do this for not only mortality. Um, a lot of people think of us as a quality database, a database for quality metrics, but I will tell you that more and more organizations are starting to see the value of our cost estimates and our utilization estimates. We have metrics in the clinical database for not only quality um, metrics, but also safety metrics, operational metrics, and financial metrics. And so, for example, I can find out if I'm Hospital X that I'm 38th out of 39th in direct cost for spinal fusion patients. Same way, looking at that direct cost index, getting the top 10 for those organizations uh, that do well in that cost. And then again, without the ability to drill down, it's useless. Without the ability to say, I'm looking at myself now in differences between X, Y, L, Z, and M, then you can start to, um, to understand why you're different. Well, sure, I'm a lot more in med surge supplies, MS is med surge supplies over here, than Y, L, X, and M. I'm a lot more. I'm, a, I'm almost double than, than most of those other organizations. But if I only stopped there, if I only stopped there, I wouldn't, uh, be able to look at all the other variation that's existing, the variation that might exist in accommodations or in ancillary services. So if we look at the green bar, I'm a couple thousand dollars in ancillary services, whereas everybody else is only about $500. That is what we're really moving our organizations to. Rather than just looking at med surge supplies or rather than just looking at drugs, we want organizations to look at everything uh, combined so that they can get an understanding of where they can reduce variation. We have transparency within organizations too, so you can look at it by surgeon or by physician the same way that you're comparing um, against uh, external hospitals. 
but this allows you then to really drill down very distinctly into this. So remember ancillary services, uh, we looked at, uh, we were higher. If we didn't know where we were higher, if we didn't know where we were higher, then I would say that that would be useless information. Uh, the database allows Hospital X then to say, I only want to look at Y and Z, combine their um, uh, um, intensity factors and cost for ancillary diagnostics, drugs, labs, and bloods. The intensity factor can be thought of as a cost. The higher the intensity factor, the higher the cost. And we can see for ancillary services, sure enough, we're at 15.4 X or Y and Z are at 6.8. And it's in somatosensory testing and interoperative monitoring where we're higher. 80% of our patients are getting somatosensory testing uh, for the spinal fusion patients, only 4% from the hospital's Y and Z. Now, is this the end game? No, what we found is that when you go back to the surgeons and they say something like, well, somatosensory, somatosensory testing is best practice, you can then tell them, well, Y and Z are only using it 4% uh, of the time. And when you typically tell them who Y and Z is, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, Duke, um, or um, Sanford Sioux Falls, uh, those uh, the physicians start to pay attention. They start to look and they said, hmm, if you want to get in contact with Sioux Falls and, and Sanford, we'd be more than happy to get you to that because, again, uh, many times you're not clinical. You're not going to know if there's a therapeutic equivalent that could be used for this that might even be more expensive. Doubt it in this case because, again, our intensity factor or cost is more high, much higher than uh, the other organizations. So it allows for those conversations. It allows for the engagement of our clinicians. All right, so we've talked about uh, transparency by the hospital level. I also want to talk about an attribute that we have in the clinical database that is um, sometimes overlooked, and that's also our transparency in all of our methodologies. Uh, the database, uh, because we're transparent, we don't sell the data outside, we don't show the data outside, we don't allow access to people uh, outside of the subscribers of the hospitals that uh, subscribe to that organization. Because of that, not only can the hospital names be transparent, but all methodologies can, and you can find those uh, methodologies on the CDB. I'm going to talk about the risk adjustment and, and why that is important to be transparent. Uh, risk adjustment, our risk adjustment is the best in the industry. Uh, I think uh, that's the case because it's constructed with member input. Uh, David Levine, uh, who's the uh, head of our analytics uh, department, uh, runs a risk methodology task force. Uh, that meets four times a year, uh, physicians, PhDs on it that really take a look at our risk adjustment to be able to understand it and see what we're doing uh, to do it well. The other reason why it's the best in the industry is because we're the only uh, organization that takes the patient and puts them into a clinical condition and then models that patient only against others in that clinical condition. And that's very important. And so let me tell you about 3M's risk adjustment and its comparison to the th uh, risk adjustment that we have. 3M builds four models for their risk of mortality, minor, moderate, major, and extreme. And every patient is put into one of those four levels or four models based on the one model that they build where they, um, where they um, fall. If you were to try to find out how to take a patient and, and, and move them from the moderate category to the major category, it is excruciatingly difficult. There are three different purple books and volumes that you would look through to say, well, if the patient has this, then go here. If the patient has this, then go here. To be able to understand that really what you wanted to be able to do is code uh, or document and code trach on admission day to be able to get that patient there. Not so with our risk adjustment. Our risk adjustment, because we break everyone out into clinical conditions, we're writing 400 separate models for mortality, 400 for length of stay, 400 for cost. And each one of those is a specific clinical condition. And so what you're looking at right now is part of the heart transplant model that where we take, we've taken the 7,961 patients that had a heart transplant in our academic medical centers over the last two years and they have about a 10% mortality rate. And so we're adding in about 500 variables and only those that are uh, statistically significant for mortality stay in. So 
So what that basically says is that if it's a male uh, between the ages of 80 and 85, that is the highest beta-weighted predictor for mortality in heart transplant patients. It's going to be very different for craniotomy patients, very different from total hip and total knee patients. But what this allows you to do, this transparency into the variables, into the explanatory variables, it allows you to then go back into the database to see uh, where were patients uh, in that clinical condition not uh, um, coded with certain things or not within the age range that you were talking about. And we've now added the functionality in the database for you to drill down and, and look at comorbids. So, for example, this organization, uh, when we look at the top 10 most frequently frequent variables in our mortality models over on the right-hand side, you can see that they coded and documented and coded malnutrition about 2% of the time, whereas the custom compare group, again, a transparent custom compare group that they've built on their own, coded it 4.6% of the time. Malnutrition is one of the most frequent variables in there, and so the more you code that, the higher your expected values are going to be. Great database to be able to drill down and help uh, coding and, and documentation to be able to improve to get you where you want to go. A lot of people, though, will tell me, well, when we see improvements in a certain metric, this is probably just documenta documentation and coding. When I see real improvements, like I've seen over the last three years from places like, for example, Nebraska, Penn State, West Virginia, I see the expected line going up. So, yeah, they're doing some great documentation coding work and the observe line going down at the same time. And I don't think that that can happen uh, without the ability to, to look at things transparently. Another poll um, that's coming up right now, uh, based on this, so I just get curious of how many of you now currently are routinely leveraging others outside of your organization to accelerate improvement. And what I mean by this is how many of you have gone through a kind of what I've described where you're developing custom compare groups, you're actually reaching out to some of those organizations in the custom compare groups, or you're reaching out to Vizient to get you introduced to those how many of you are emailing them? How many of you are working together to be able to do this? Because that's really what transparency allows you to do. So, Stacy, if we can pull up the, if we can end the poll and pull up the uh, answers, I'd be curious to see um, what percentage of our organizations are doing that right now. Remember, um, looking at this as a team sport. I really believe that this is the next wave of improvement is to be able to, no matter if they're competitors or not, getting to the point where you're doing this. So the poll has ended. We are just waiting. We have most folks have not answered, uh, which is typical for this, but we do have about 21 who are saying yes and 18 that are saying no. So the others either just didn't get enough time, didn't understand the question, or uh, probably in the no category. I'm going to just put you in the no category if you didn't answer that. My um, uh, theory is if you engage in the data, which we just showed you how to do, and you collaborate, and I'm going to show you a little bit more about how you can collaborate further in just a second, you will improve like these organizations um, have done. Uh, neurosurgery at UCLA saw a really nice improvement in risk-adjusted mortality and risk-adjusted length of stay over a certain period of time. How did it happen? Leadership focus. Uh, their chair of neurosurgery, uh, who um, uh, UCLA's neurosurgery is ranked very highly in the U.S. News World and Report uh, neurosurgery group, uh, didn't like where his organization was landing in terms of risk-adjusted mortality and risk-adjusted length of stay against peer comparisons in the CDB, engaged us, uh, delved down into the data, developed a, a, a custom compare group that he wanted to be able to look at, reached out to some of those organizations. He knew many of the people at those organizations, and over time brought in a lot of different improvements that um, saw, again, uh, observed from 7.37 to 3.57 and expected from 5.69 to 6.3. How do you get to, to that collaboration? As I mentioned before, this slide is a, a duplicative slide. You'll see on the left-hand side what we bring to you. We want to be able to get you engaged in collaboration. How do we do that? Well, there are a number of ways that we can do that. Face-to-face -face events, listserv questions, sharing of best practices, 
Uh, many of you are part of member networks already. Many of you are part of listservs. Anytime an organization purchases uh, the clinical database, for example, we have a CDB coordinator assigned uh, from that organization. We have a CDB executive. They have listservs. They have the ability to get face-to-face -face questions. What does that mean? That means that you can listen into any of the webinars that we have, including the one we have right now. You can go into uh, um, and get the results. You can listen to those at your leisure. Uh, and then we also have the best conference that I think is available in healthcare that occurs every year, our Clinical Connection Summit, last year in Dallas. This year it's in Denver in mid-September. Not only will you get your rankings if you're in the CDB, uh, those rankings occur uh, all the, uh, each year, but it's the best because of two reasons. First of all, there are, uh, there's incredible content. Uh, I'm now one of a team at Vizient that's going through about 850 abstracts that we've just received for the rapid-fire presentations of that Clinical Connection Summit. These are 30-minute, 75, 30-minute presentations that are uh, very, very high-level content, very well attended uh, by individuals, and so those occur, which are excellent. The second reason I always tell people that I think this is the best is happy hour. Now, if you know me, you know that I'm a wino, and happy hour is one of the uh, best things of my day. However, it's not the wine that is the reason for it being uh, such a great um, uh, part of the conference. It's the networking occur. So once you get to develop that relationship with those 15 or 20 other organizations and those 15 to 20 other people, this is a great connection point to be able to see them and talk to them and get to know them. Here's an example of a list server question. This is from Dave Kaplan, if you're on the phone. Hello, Dave, uh, from New York Presbyteria, uh, Presbyterian Hospital. And he's asking, who's putting on the expected date of discharge on the electronic, on electronic medical record on the day of admission? Because it's shown in some organizations to reduce length of stay. And he received 40 or 50 responses. He uh, then contacted five additional folks to get some more information on them, got to know these people, networked with them. He puts together all that information and then sends it back out on the listserv. What a fabulous way to get um, this information out. What a fabulous, nice way to be able to network and get some understanding of how to do this. I don't believe this could have happened without uh, the transparency that we have available to you from Vizient. Hundreds of case studies, best practices, presentations, all identified so if you want to look at uh, what exactly UCLA did in neurosurgery to get those improvements, that's a case study that we have that you can attach. And it will give you contact information, not only from Vizient, but also from UCLA if you want to further, uh, further um, look into this. Our collaboratives are fabulous. They're six to nine month uh, resource intensive. These are Again, uh, you get to work with other organizations in Vizient to be able to improve in one key area, those subtopic areas. And uh, if you are in any of those, you know the value of those. Uh, you know the value of the transparency and the insights and the networking with other organizations. And we found in the gold bars that those organizations that are engaged in those collaboratives are improving more rapidly than those uh, that are not engaged in the purple. I'm not going to um, ask for another poll because, again, I uh, mentioned to you that uh, I don't expect to change anybody's mind on this, but just to remind everybody uh, where uh, people were um, back uh, at the beginning of it, they were all across the board um, in terms of which of the following do you think is the biggest barrier for performance improvement in your organization. And I have to say that... Um, uh, I expected these results, be and I wanted to come back to this question because of one th key um, missing component or missing um, um, uh, uh, missing uh, suggestion here, which is not only A, B, C, D, and E, but also F, which is all of the above. Um, all of the above is really uh, the answer to this question. And I know that some of you were probably frustrated that all of the above was not there. Uh, and sorry for that, uh, but the fact is is that the transparency that we have allows for all of these things to move much more rapidly beyond where they are right now. I've always said we have to get beyond data in terms of getting performance improvement to occur. You only need two things for an improvement to occur. You need data 
and that data must motivate a change. But first and foremost, we've got to get beyond the data. And I'm going to leave you with a quote from uh, the chief quality officer at Sanford Health when we were up there uh, selling the CDB to their wonderful system in the Dakotas. Uh, the chief quality officer, after hearing about transparency and hearing about some of the concerns of transparency that other leaders at Sanford had, said, you know what, without transparency, uh, improvement is made much more difficult, uh, something that I couldn't have said better and couldn't agree with more. I believe that is the end of the, uh, dis of the presentation. And so what we're going to do now is I'm going to look to see if, in fact, there were some uh, questions. Um, I'm going to ask Stacy, I think, to help me um, uh, to determine what questions uh, we have. So where do we get the slides? Um, Stacy, do you know that answer? I don't. Um, think uh, she does, uh, but I will tell you that uh, these slides will be available. The recording will be available. Uh, give it a couple of days, and then they'll be on the website. And if you can't find it, um, uh, then just let us know, and we will get it for you. Is the product available to Vizient members? Absolutely it is. And so one of the uh, reasons um, for this, uh, for this uh, um, webinar was to be able to highlight uh, the clinical database. So if this is something of interest to you, as it has been for a lot of new, um, uh, uh, newer organizations to Vizient, just let anyone at Vizient know that you'd be interested in learning more about the clinical database. Um, and Liz just sent me something about the, uh, the slides, but they will be available. A quick question, is there an easy way to add, remove hospitals, and to duplicate a comparison list? For me, it takes a long time to add five new ones to an existing group by scrolling through that list? It's a great question. It's an absolute great question. So the um, answer is, is that when you build a custom compare group, you can manage that custom compare group on the home page of the CDB up in um, the right-hand corner. You click on, um, uh, click on what I think is called um, uh, your preferences. And then within that preferences, that's where you manage the custom compare list. That's a fabulous question because it's not necessarily uh, spelled out when you build your custom compare group. Again, when you want to add hospitals, when you want to delete hospitals, when we want to change a custom compare group, go to the CDB homepage, click on, I think it says my preferences up at the top, and there's an entire section for managing custom compare lists. I have a question uh, uh, on slide 12 about hospital profiler. Um, it was just a graphic on the slide where it showed best hospitals like peer um, hospitals. So one of the things that I didn't um, highlight with this, and I think this question is getting at, is that in the hospital profiler, I mentioned that there is a, a three sections to it. The general section, we showed the profile section, and there was one called base MSDRG. If you want to be able to get a quick idea of who's doing well, in certain base MSDRGs and mortality and length of stay, complications, so on and so forth. That third tab, the base MSDRG tab, you can go into and select mortality risk adjusted and select the base MSDRG and it'll show you very quickly who's done well in the last year in that. Um, in the hospital express, or the, I'm sorry, the, the report express where you can go in and get those template reports, this is another um, uh, another avenue where this question may be taking us. That uh, drill down I didn't show, but every one of those metrics you can click on in the web and it will come up with more information about yourself, including the top 10. So again, uh, you can get that information. Um, VIP reports, but the lag on it when they're updated is long that it becomes kind of stale as they're planned to speed up that process. Uh, there, uh, we do now have that um, updated and on a monthly basis. Sometimes it's a little bit uh, later than I would like. I agree with the question. And so what uh, we encourage organizations to do is to be able to look at the VIP report but use the report builder because the report builder has the most up-to-date data. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we get monthly data into the report builder. We get monthly data into uh, that on, on a uh, almost by, not almost, every hospital gives us monthly data. 
What that means is that for January patients, we want those bills to be out of the house before you submit the January patients to us. And so most of our organizations are submitting that data between May 1st and May 14th. I feel comfortable by May 17th that almost all of those um, hospitals, uh, all of our hospitals have their data in for January. Uh, so that is the most up-to-date data that we have. I realize that our template reports might be a little bit stale in terms of either giving that monthly data, but that's three months um, afterwards, or quarterly data. So we encourage organizations to do is really look in on a monthly basis that report builder because you can get all that data recreated uh, in the report builder. Um, okay, we have uh, the slide, uh, the question on slide 12 uh, was not answered uh, correctly, so I'm going to quickly go back and see if I can uh, go to slide 12 to see if I can understand exactly what might, uh, what the answer might be. So if you bear with me for a couple seconds, I can get there. And so this is the um, slide, and the question again was, um, and if, Farida, if you're um, still on, I would love to um, see if you can ask the question a different way, because when I'm reading the question, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. Choose to compare. I do not see an answer. Choose to compare yourself against higher ranked hospitals like peers geographically. Um, that's going to be something I, I would be happy to uh, take offline um, uh, with you because any of those are available now in, in the report builder to be able to take a look at higher ranked hospitals like peer geographically. And so I would invite you to contact me um, separately. And uh, I, can, I can help you walk through exactly how you can get to the point where you can find out who um, to choose uh, as comparisons. The deck and the recording link will be sent out tomorrow. So let Liz Morley know if uh, you uh, did not receive it. So just to um, let you know that. Any other questions, uh, last minute questions? Awesome. Well, we will end about five minutes earlier so you can get to your next meeting or to lunch. Um, I appreciate uh, the time and uh, look forward to interacting with all of you. Um, uh, before some of you leave, how do we contact Liz? It's Liz Morley. So Liz, um, Liz Morley. Um, well, actually, she will contact you because she has all your email addresses. So thank you. Take care.